I'm in the studio with Louise Abbott, and there's a fascinating studio, and we'll take a look at some of her equipment here. Uh, she is a textile weaver, textile artist, and has been for a number of years, but it didn't start out in textiles, did it? Where uh, you, you had a, a career outside of the textile industry, right. and this was kind of a side thing that you were doing. Correct. So what what is what is your academic and uh, professional background? Well, I um, went to college and then got my master's at Northeastern, and I was a teacher, and I taught second grade in two different school systems uh, for four years. And then after that, um, I, I had a family, so I didn't teach after that. And when I eventually got back into the working world, I took several different paths, but everything seemed to lead to textiles. How did you initially get uh, uh, interested in weaving? Well, I'm a knitter. I'm a prolific knitter. I like working with my hands. And I saw somebody at a craft fair working on a loom, and I was fascinated. And I said, I want to learn how to do that. So I took private lessons from a woman I sought out, and um, then I eventually worked for her as a contract weaver. I wove the adage. This has been a, uh, an avocation of yours for about, you say, 50 years? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. You were involved a little bit professionally in the textile industry, kind of by, uh, kind of by invitation. Yeah, I was. I was asked to join Joan Fabrics uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts. They made automotive body cloth and upholstery fabric uh, for the furniture industry. And I was in their yarn division, which their mill was on Dutton Street, which is now really basically apartments in downtown Lowell. And um, after that, um, and then I became their operations manager for the, for the spinning mill. I was that for a year and a half. And then I migrated to Fall River and I worked for their competitor in Fall River, uh, Quaker Fabrics, and they made um, upholstery fabric for the furniture industry, and they also made um, yarn for the fashion industry out of New York. So some of our clients were Liz Claiborne and others in New York City. All of these have a, a different purpose. The one you're standing next to now, um, what is, how do, you, how do you decide which, <laughs> how do you decide which one to use? Well, um, a lot depends on the harnesses. This has eight harnesses. The more harnesses you have, the more intricate a pattern you can get on your, on your cloth. And it also has a warp beam, so I can warp from the back if I so choose, which is very, very handy. And I wind the warp on at two inch increments. Um, this loom was my very first loom. I love it. And it's a Norwood and it's 50 inches wide, so I can do something a little under 50 inches on it. I can weave as wide as the harnesses. You have to thread all your warp threads through pedals, they're called pedals, on the harnesses and in a particular sequence, and that's how you get your, your design. And then you tie the treadles below to the harnesses in a particular sequence. So when I press on a harness, certain, uh, when I press on a treadle, certain harnesses will lift, and then I pass the fabric, the cloth right through there. You know, the yarn, I'm sorry. Um, so just for everybody's, um, for people who are listening here that don't know textiles, the term warp and weft, right. uh, the, the warp is, are the threads that run lengthwise, right. and the weft runs crosswise. Right. The warp is the foundation of, of the cloth. Usually the warp is the stronger of the two, and your weft is goes across in a particular sequence. So that's how cloth is made, and that's how it's been made for hundreds of years. Um, so this is the warp. I'm making scars, that's what these are. The designs, where did do the designs for the fabrics come from? Um, it, it, a lot determines what I'm making. If I'm making clothing, some designs are better than others, like twills, for example, because it will hang better. A twill will hang much better than, say, a, a plain weave fabric. Um, so that is an advantage. And I usually let what I'm making dictate 
the weave structure that I'm going to be using. We were talking a little earlier about a couple of patterns that you've woven. Uh, this one in particular called the dog tracks pattern. Now, a lot of these patterns are, are kind of standard patterns, yes? Um, yes, with variations in the uh, type of yarn that you use to make them. I mean, this was a pattern that I saw on a plantation outside of New Orleans on a trip I went there a number of years ago. And a gentleman was weaving it on the loom, and I was, I was fascinated by it. And he very kindly shared the uh, name of the pattern. It's an overshot, and it's called Dog Tracks. And if you look carefully, you can see that it looks like Dog Tracks. And so, I mean, they frequently name patterns um, after what they look like. So I came home, and I started making some rugs using the dog track pattern. This was another one I did as a sample. So a lot of the patterns patterns that you use are things that have been done before, but with just variations. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. There's nothing new under the sun. I mean, other than what you bring to the table with your own creativity and how you want to put things together. Mm -hmm. When you're laying, up, uh, laying out a pattern to weave, it's kind of like, uh, it's almost like programming a computer, it seems like, because you have to uh, manage their, the, their, the treadles and the different types of yarn going, uh, forming the weft the weft <laughs> and all of that has to be to, to, to create a pattern has to be orchestrated and there's a way of there's a way of writing that down right, right. a kind of shorthand for doing that they call it a drawdown you draw it down and you usually put in your weave structure you put in your treadling um, in a diagram and then you pl plug in the materials you're going to use so as you're actually as you're actually weaving, you you follow you follow that diagram. Yes, it's very mathematical. I mean, I do a ton of math before I even sit down at the loom, calculating how many warps per inch I need, how many wefts per inch I need, so I make sure I have enough sufficient supply to make what I want to make, um, and that's all calculation. So what is this? Uh, this is another loom that you're standing next right. to here in, in front of you. What is this one used for? Um, this actually is a smaller loom. It's a shaft. It's a, it's a four harness loom as opposed to an eight harness. And of course, I, I, I've only threaded four harness on, on this one, but uh, I can only thread four in this because that's all there are there. Um, this is going to be a tapestry, a small tapestry. So I've worked it with um, linen and... Um, I've got a preliminary design in my head, so I have to just put it on paper and figure it out and then sit down and weave it. This loom was made in Michigan, and it is a fantastic loom. It is a Cranbrook, and if you Google Cranbrook, you will see there's a school in Michigan called the Cranbrook School, and it's a, it was a textile and art school at one time, and this loom was made there. Um, I don't think they manufacture this loom anymore, but they have a plaque on here, in the front here, that says a Cranbrook loom, um, Fremont, Michigan. And it's, it's a rug loom, it's very heavy. Um, you can weave anything on it. I mean, I don't necessarily have to be limited to rugs, but the reason it's so great for rugs is because of the weight of the beater. So when you're making a rug, you really have to beat it in so that it packs down because your warp and your weft are usually much heavier than what I'm going to be using on these looms and it's a great loom this happens to be an eight harness loom and um, right now I've only got um, the first four threaded because of the weave structure this is a counter mosh loom and what that means is it separates the warps go up and the warps go down. So if I were to step on, you can see two are up and two are down. Those are jack looms, and jack means I'm jacking it up, and that's exactly what the harnesses do over there. I lift them all. You don't have any go down, you just have harnesses going up to make the separation. This gives me the separation I need 
by separating two, not lifting four, if that makes sense. And then you run the... Uh, then I run the, the weft through there, for example. Oh, I'm actually taking it out. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> well, that doesn't matter because I, I need to go back and redo this anyway. So, say I put this in here. And then I would press another one based on the sequence. I don't even know what the sequence is at this point. I'd have to look at my notes. And this, this is just a filler. This is not the weft that I'm going to be used. This is just a filler that I put in all my rugs in the beginning. Uh, I always put a filler in to beat it against. And this is all linen, beautiful linen. So this was put together um, pipes from hardware store. And it's a tapestry loom. It's just basically a pipe frame, pipe loom. And um, this is tapestry. I use it in, in teaching as an example. And um, these are different techniques in tapestry you could do. And um, I did them to show what it looks like. On the back side, you can see you've got ends. But that's OK. It doesn't matter. I usually will tie those off and knot them so they won't be quite so large. You can buy a frame, just a frame at a at an art store and, and use that. The disadvantage of that is you don't have the tensioning device. This has its own little tensioning device and um, I use this for teaching as well so that you wind your warp and you can tension it by turning the screws here and that's important to give tension. Yeah, so, so where would you buy something like this? Well, you go online and I, you can go on Etsy. I, mean, I think there are some places that sell little small tapestry looms on Etsy. So um, uh, Schacht, I know, has a small tapestry loom. If you Google ta small tapestry hand looms, you'll get different places that sell them and they're not expensive. Um, I participated, I was fortunate to participate in an exhibit at the Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton, Massachusetts. And it was in conjunction with the Boston Weavers Guild. And I belong to the Boston Weavers Guild. And it was to celebrate their 100th anniversary. Boston Weavers Guild is the oldest weaving guild in the country. And so they partnered with Fuller three years ago to come up with this, de this whole design, this whole show and exhibit. The Fuller Craft Museum is a wonderful museum. It uh, was started in the uh, 1960s, uh, towards the end of the 60s, and it was uh, invented to show the light on things made by hand, like woodworking, um, fiber, um, glass, ceramics, paper, anything that you can manipulate with your hand, other than painting. Painting is not part of the Fuller. So this exhibit was, uh, I had uh, three pieces in the exhibit, and it was a juried show, and it was up from May through October, and it was wonderful. And this was one of the pieces I put in. It's a rug. It's called Unity. And we had to describe uh, and write a piece about why, why we made it. One of the things that we had to do for this in addition was to have something relevant for the last hundred years. You know, what is so special about the last hundred years that you wanted to weave a piece about it? So I decided to do Unity. And um, it's a tapestry rug. Its wharf is linen and the weft is wool. And it's tapestry because when you do fabric, your weft goes from salvage to salvage. But when you do tapestry, it doesn't go from salvage to salvage. Your weft might stop midway and then come back. And as you can see here, that's exactly what happened. And it happened over here. And then uh, there's more areas here where different colors were employed. And I would weave to here and then go back. And then this one would weave in the middle and then this one would weave on the end. So that is why this was a tapestry design rug. And then the fringe 
is um, uh, done on the top and the bottom. I twine it and then I braid it. This piece was another piece that I had in the Fuller exhibit and it, it was called Migration and it was inspired by a book I read called The Warmth of Other Suns which was a wonderful wonderful book and when you think about migration everything migrates everything in the world migrates not only people um, but uh, birds animals the ocean everything so this is called a transparency it's a form of tapestry weaving and it's transparent, it's called transparency because you can see light through it. And it's actually a Scandinavian uh, technique because they would hang these in the windows uh, of their homes and the light would come through so they'd get to see the design. Louise, how do you uh, get visibility for your work? You, uh, you exhibit and you exhibit locally, but you also exhibit uh, across the country. Yes, um, I try. I belong to uh, several organizations, and through the organizations, there's lots of opportunity to exhibit. Um, this summer, I was in Knoxville, Tennessee, because I attended Convergence, which is a very large uh, textile uh, convention that happens every two years. And because of COVID, it had been postponed a year. So I had a piece in a show down there. Um, I have had pieces in Puerto Vallarta, in Mexico. Um, I've had pieces, um, well, <laughs> I have to stop and think, a lot of places, um, because uh, the organizations I belong to uh, are always having exhibits opportunities for artists if you want to join. But what I do takes so much time, so I have to be selective about where I go and, and what I exhibit. Um, I've exhibited in Wisconsin, um, uh, West Coast. Um, and there's a few other places around the country that I've exhibited in. You've been retired now for several years? Yes, yes. So how, uh, how important is weaving to uh, your post, <laughs> your post. post career <laughs> life? Oh, it's, it's amazing. It's so important because it gets me out with people. I'm engaged artistically with what I love to do. Um, it gives me the opportunity to network with other artists. I belong to a couple of galleries in downtown Lowell um, where I show my work and I love networking with other artists. Um, it's an opportunity to grow and keep yourself open. I've done a lot of traveling. I've been all, all, a lot of places in Europe. I've been very fortunate and so I always seek out textiles when I travel. And you do this a lot. You you spend a lot of time down here in your uh, in your studio. Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah. Books on tape are great, <laughs> and I love music. So I just come down here and um, I just start weaving. The hard part is distractions. You know, I'm I'm constantly being pulled away for various reasons, and that's frustrating because I just want to weave. I just want to weave. Where are you currently exhibiting? Um, I have a piece at the Brush Gallery um, that was juried in, and the opening is this coming Saturday. And I have a, I have a wall. I run a wall at the Arts League of Lowell that I've, I've been there since they started. And so I exhibit my work there. Yeah, so you that's a, the co-op. You are a co-op member yes. at the Arts League of Lowell. Yeah. Yes. And that, by the way, is at 307 Market Street in Lowell, Massachusetts. Correct. Oh, thank you. You're right, Ed. <laughs> It's a great gallery. It's really, I'm the only textile person there. Everything else is art of different mediums, but not textiles. Good for you. Well, thank you very much for your time. This has been a very interesting experience. Um, really never knew anything about this, but I, I do love machinery and these looms are things of beauty. Yeah, they really are and functional. <laughs> yeah. so, so thank you very much. Thank you.